Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar on Gender Smart Investing, the benefits for investors and how it works. I'm here with your host Samuel Baumgartner and our gender equality advocate Corianne van Veen. Before I hand over to the experts, let me introduce you to the housekeeping information. As you might have all noticed, you're currently on mute. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the right hand side bar and we'll answer them towards the end of this session. A few words on responsibility investments. We are a leading impact asset manager specializing in private market investments across three investment themes, financial inclusion, climate finance, and sustainable food. We manage 3.5 billion US dollars in assets across 280 portfolio, invest, portfolio companies in 75 countries. And now over to you, Corianne and Samuel. Thank you very much, Francisca. Um, a very warm welcome to you, Corianne. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Samuel. Happy and, uh, a happy International Women's Day to you too. Obviously also a very warm welcome to the audience. We have uh, quite a turnout here going through the list. We have uh, attendees joining from Peru, Japan, Cameroon, Armenia, Switzerland, of course, to name a few. It's always a big pleasure to, to, to have such a great turnout into this uh, webinar. Um, to kick it off, uh, maybe we give, would like to give the audience a bit of, a, of an insight to who you are, Corianne. Um, why don't you uh, introduce yourself briefly, please? Yeah, of course. Um, so my name is Corianne van Veen. I have a background in both anthropology and uh, in development economics. I have worked in the last seven years in development finance and increasingly doing so uh, with a gender lens. Um, I've been part of the setup of the 2X Challenge uh, and the 2X Collaborative, now called 2X Global. Uh, and currently I'm a senior uh, ESG and investment officer at Responsibility and uh, as well the gender advocate. Great. Welcome again and thank you for taking your time to be here. We would also uh, like to take an opportunity to get to know the audience, the attendees a little bit. And for that, we have a short question for you. Um, we would like to know how important the gender smart investing is uh, for you. So to kick this off, and while we do this, uh, I would like to clean up with some of the definitions with you, Corianne. Um, you know, could you could you give us a short definition of what gender smart investing as an investment strategy is? Yeah, of course. Uh, so an investment smart investment strategy is a, a, an investment strategy that intentionally and measurably uses capital to address gender disparity. Uh, and it really lets it inform its decision making in terms of making the investments. And is there a difference between gender smart and gender lens investing? Yeah, not really. Uh, the terms are really used interchangeably. Uh, the focus here is really the intentionality. Um, so by applying a gender lens, you can make an investment gender smart, but they're using used interchangeably. Perfect. And I think in the meanwhile, we should get the results from the questionnaire. Um, quite an interesting mix. Uh, so we have quite a few people uh, working in the area, uh, but we also have a bit of a turnout of people who are very new on this and, uh, and are keen to, to learn. And then obviously quite a good mix in between uh, that uh, find this topic important. Um, and we hope that we also can shift the ones that are currently in somewhat important to the, to the very important part, uh, given the, the, the relevance of, of this topic. Um, so, you know, when, when we look at this, it's, it's been popping up more recently. So we see that gender, uh, gender smart investing is a, is a relatively new consideration, but it's developing fast. Um, you know, could you share with us what some of the biggest uh, developments in the last couple of years have been? Because it has been around for, for a little bit of time, right? Yeah, of course. Um, so a couple of years ago, um, gender lens investing was really new and, and a niche. And I would say one of the biggest developments is that now it's considered more broadly. Um, I think you can also see that in the answers uh, from today. Um, so I see the private investment arm of the World Bank um, show that two thirds of investors in emerging markets actually consider that diversity of investment teams is important when they are committing capital. 
Um, and what we also saw is that between 2017 and 2021, uh, the number of funds that apply to gender lens have tripled. So by now, around 6 billion US dollars of investments are raised with the gender lens. Um, so I think this transition from a niche to uh, more broadly considered is one of the biggest developments. Um, I do want to say it's definitely not the norm yet, and I think that's also why we're here and, uh, and want to talk about this topic. Um, maybe just to mention in responsibility, uh, it is also making its way into, uh, let's say, more broadly thinking. Um, so currently, both in renewable energy and sustainable agri-funds, we are considering a gender lens, uh, as well as in the social bond and, uh, of course, in financial inclusion uh, uh, products that we have. So clearly some players have been active for, for quite some time, but more on the on the retail side or on the private sector side, it's been moving up on the on the agenda. So perhaps maybe uh, you know it's it's not such a first mover's advantage anymore to to start addressing uh, the topic, but there's still a lot of opportunities when looking at gender smart uh, investing. So how does how does an investor need to go about this uh, when when he would like to start considering uh, gender uh, into the investment process? Yeah, I think the most important thing is to really look at the investment process that an investor is using now. So where in the cycle does applying a general lens fit? Um, and I think the first step for many of us is information. So of course, as an investor, you want to know and understand the company that you invest in. Um, so you look at these things like, uh, what is the composition of the board? How do they do their HR processes? What do their customers look like? and use that information that then you gather on that topic uh, to have a conversation. So together with the company, in a conversation, you can identify where are opportunities, where are gaps that we see. And I think it's very important that you really do that in conversation because you truly want to have the buy-in uh, from both sides to really commit to this. Um, and this is also what we've done at Responsibility. So we integrated uh, gender uh, data information and, and gather that information in the cycle. So we did that um, at time of investment, but also in monitoring throughout and using it sometimes for uh, really informing uh, gender action plans, for example. So, I mean, if, if you if you look at it, uh, obviously we've now we've now gone through a bit of of what it is and and how it works. Um, if you're a private investor, a private individual looking to allocate uh, some money, maybe your saving part of your savings or so, um, why, why should this topic be relevant for you? We've, you've mentioned the IFC earlier, who's been allocating larger sums into the into the topic. Uh, what would the bridge be to the to the private uh, private capital? Yeah, I think it's very important to understand why we should care about this in the first place. Um, well, of course, there's the benefits uh, for women as well as men, right? Both, both benefit from more equality. Uh, but I also want to highlight two things here. And one is the potential economic benefits and the benefits for the investor. So economically, there is quite some information out there on how the, the economy as a whole can really benefit from this. Uh, McKinsey actually has done a study and they identified that uh, by advancing women's equality, we could add 12 trillion US dollars to the world economy. Um, just to put that in perspective, that is last year's GDP of Germany, Canada and Japan combined. So that is a huge potential. Um, as an investor, there's definitely also a benefit. So there's a whole market to tap into. And sometimes that can be in terms of um, uh, having more opportunities to hire women as employees, but it also really in the customer base. So, um, yeah, here I just want to highlight something that we've seen in Responsibilities Portfolio. So we have done microfinance for a couple of years um, and there the beneficiaries are very often women. But now we're also looking more at opportunities for uh, women-owned uh, SMEs, for example, and female entrepreneurs. Um, so in some areas in which we operate, up to 40% of SMEs are actually women-owned or women-led. Um, but IFC has shown that more than 70% of uh, women-owned SMEs worldwide are currently underserved. So there's a huge market opportunity there, and there is a, a big one to tap into. Um, so extending financial services there is truly an opportunity also for investors. So when looking at these enterprises, um, we we know that diversification and, and women-run businesses 
uh, tend to do very well. Do you have some some examples on on how that then also kind of reflects on on performance? I mean, in the end, as an investor, you want to see how your investment is going and how the underlying asset uh, goes. Uh, could you share some some examples with us, please? Yeah, of course. So part of that is is the consumer base and the market. But uh, one thing that has a lot of attention nowadays is is diversity as well. So when we look actually at investment teams themselves, uh, more diversity can definitely be a benefit. And IFC estimates that the net internal rate of return uh, is 20% higher when an investment team is more gender balanced. Um, but also in companies, you know, as an investor, if you invest in a company, uh, diversity can definitely benefit the bottom line of the company. So uh, McKinsey here showed that the, the most diverse companies are 20, 25% more likely to have an above average profitability than the least diverse companies. Um, and of course, I want to highlight this is not a causal relationship, right, in terms of diversity. So it's not that adding one or two women in the board automatically makes a company better. Uh, but it's definitely showed that uh, a, a culture of inclusiveness and, uh, and diversity is linked to better returns for a company and a better resilience. So be beyond including it in the in the investment process, knowing now or having learned that the, these these assets tend to to perform well, uh, you know what, what can I as an investor do to increase diversity? You know what 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 can be my contribution uh, to 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 approach this topic? Yeah, it depends, of course, on the context. So I think as an investor, you also want to really uh, adjust your. Uh, your way of working to the company that you work with but i think we all have to admit that when we look around in, a, in an average boardroom uh, the group around the table is pretty homogenous um, and this is a systemic issue uh, and the result of, of centuries of how we've been working and this is not changing overnight um, so I think it is important to really think about as an investor, what can you do to promote diversity? And um, that can be, for example, thinking about hiring practices, uh, but also in, in the board. Um, can you think about succession planning and, and how you consider diversity in this? Um, do you have ways to identify high potential women in the company and create opportunities for them? Perhaps it can be through a mentoring program perhaps internal targets can help. So there's many ways in which you can really try and tweak and make sure that you do consider diversity uh, throughout all levels. So maybe maybe shifting the narrative a bit now to prioritization, right? I took a, new, a look at the news this morning and uh, you're being flooded with things that should be on top of your mind. Uh, you know, you have climate change, you have conflicts, you have a whole range of, uh, of topics. Um, what would your argument be to put uh, gender smart approaches on the top of the agenda? Why, why should I focus, uh, focus on this topic as, a, as an absolute priority? Yeah, I agree with you. There is a lot for us to consider. Um, but I want to highlight two things here mostly. Uh, and that is in tackling all these topics, right? You mentioned conflict, climate change and all those big issues we just cannot leave out half of the population in dealing with them. So both in terms of who is affected, which is uh, yeah, disproportionately women, but also who are the solution. And you cannot just afford to leave out the full potential of women when you address any of these topics. And the second part is, and, and we mentioned this already in, in a previous webinar that, we also, that you also did, Samuel, and that's the, the links between uh, gender equality and all of these other topics. Um, so by advancing the role of women, you can also have a, a, a potentially a positive impact on the other topics. Um, so just to give an example, um, when women earn higher incomes, they tend to spend it on health and education for their children. So what you really are doing here is that you're not only advancing the role of the woman, but you're also setting up uh, the next generation for success. Um, so. 
you know, now uh, maybe also we would like to take a look at, um, you know, we, we heard that some of the audience has been taking a look at the, at the gender smart investment approach uh, in the past, that that's already on top of their agenda. Um, we've also looked at how an investor can can approach this and we would like to know from the audience uh, where do you stand, um, do you or does your organization stand on, on gender smart when it comes to placing an, uh, an investment policy? Is this something you already have in place? Is this something that's currently in in progress that you're you're developing um, and while you're answering the the question um, I would like to debunk a couple of myths with you Corianne um, you know with the topic gaining tractions uh, what are some of the biggest misconceptions or myths that you have come across uh, um, in in the field um, yeah I think for investors an important one is that it's a bit of a myth that having a gender lens then narrows your scope for potential investments. Um, so I don't think it's about uh, then you're not able to invest here or you're only able to invest there. It's really about identifying the impacts that you have on men and women and the opportunities that you create for them as, as employees, as consumers, and really uh, address that. So where are you potentially impacting men and where are you potentially impacting women? So it also means you don't need to overhaul your whole investment strategy. You can add it on in the process that you already have. Um, and a second part I think that is a bit of a misconception is that uh, you need to design whole new products uh, to, then, uh, to then reach out to women. Um, and I don't think you, you need that most of the time. There are exceptions, of course, but most of the time it's just really about understanding why do women not have access to my product, to my service? Why are they not entering into my workforce? So it's really about understanding what's holding them back, what are the barriers, and address those. Uh, in the meantime, we should also have the result from the poll. Um, I think this uh, somewhat reflects also the initial question uh, that we placed to, to our audience. There is already I mean, great to see that at least a quarter of the attendees have um, a gender smart investment policy uh, in place. Um, there's also quite a group that's currently developing uh, uh, a gender smart investment policy. So I think this also reflects um, reflects kind of the development that we've been seeing that there are more and more investors and people looking at investment strategies that are moving in the, into, the, into the space. Are you surprised to see these numbers, Corianne? Um, well, it's it's a good mix, I would say, that we have here, uh, and it's it's very good to see that there's uh, about a quarter that already considers this. But I think um, it also shows a little bit there's interest, right, of of the investors that do not yet have this, but yeah, are here, let's say, in this webinar. So there must be something that sparks your interest. So I hope uh, this uh, this chat, Samuel, helps them uh, to to uh, maybe develop them in the future. And, and I would like to pick it up from there as well. Um, one thing that's been burning a bit under my nails is the whole neutrality question. So if I'm if I'm an investor that says, you know, I'm neutral, I decide to not address this topic at all. It's not on my agenda. Hence, I don't cause any harm. How 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 does that fit into the narrative? Yeah, I don't agree with that. <laughs> um, so I believe there's not really such a thing as a general neutral investor. If you're not considering at all a gender lens, that basically means that you are contributing to the status quo, and that is gender inequality. Unfortunately, that is the way it is. So the World Economic Forum uh, says that if we keep moving at the current rate, it will take us another 132 years to close the gender gap. Um, so that basically means that it's not your children or grandchildren, but actually your, your grandchildren's granddaughter that will have a lifetime of equality. And I think understanding that means that it is important for us to address, also for investors. So not doing anything doesn't mean you're neutral. It means that you're, uh, yeah, you're just moving in a space that is unequal. So, you know, we've seen the benefits of the of the underlyings. We've seen the importance of of doing something, and that neutrality is not a is not an option. Um, basically, it's it's a no-brainer, right? Um, yet it seems like really struggling to get this moving. Uh, why? Yeah, I think that is the case with a lot of uh, things that are really systemic. So, gender equality is inequality is very systemic in in the world that we live in nowadays. 
um, some investors or some people in general are not aware uh, or think it's such a big issue that it is what it is, you know, what can I do? Um, and I think what we also started with, there is more and more awareness of this and more and more willingness to do something about it. Uh, but then still, of course, the first step is sometimes the hardest. Um, so I think by just taking that first step and really simply think about, okay, where in my investment cycle can I apply this? What information can I ask reasonably? Just that first step then very often inspires yeah, the larger movement. Yeah, like you said, the first step is, is the hardest, but it's also probably one of the most Im important ones to take. Um, I see Francisco is joining us, so that means we'll be moving over to the question and answers in just a moment. But I would just quickly like to wrap up uh, the key takeaways of this uh, webinar. So we've seen uh, gender smart investing represents a large pool uh, with really high quality assets. So taking that into consideration is actually should be an improvement into your investment strategy. Uh, there's a huge overlap in topics, so we, we're addressing climate change, we're addressing uh, health topics and so on, while addressing uh, the gender topic from an investments perspective. Um, and most importantly as well, an investor is not neutral by choosing not to address this topic. So including this into your investment strategy is basically the, the way to uh, promote gender uh, equality. And with that, I would like to hand over back to you, Francisco, for the Q&A session. What does responsibility do in regards to gender equality? Yeah, of course. Um, of course, we have to walk the talk, right? Um, so we are considering this in various ways. So what I already mentioned is that gathering information is a very important step. So we have integrated a gender lens into several products that we have, uh, ranging really from, from energy to financial inclusion. Um, and really, in terms of financial inclusion, this is something that is considered also in the market uh, and, and by a lot of our investees. So I think really looking outward into our portfolio, that's an important thing that we do. Uh, and secondly, I think it's also important to, to look at yourself, right, as a company in, in, in yourself. So we have a diversity, a diversity and inclusion advisory group internally uh, that really uh, discusses with uh, the, the management, uh, sets targets internally. So really um, also looking at our own uh, diversity and how we operate. How can I, as an investor, avoid greenwashing while investing in gender smart products? Are there any trustworthy labels? Yeah, this is, I think, an important one. Um, so one of the things that you often see when a, a topic gains traction, right? There is uh, a lot of us that would like to, uh, to uh, jump on board of the wagon, let's say. Um, but of course, you want to do this in a way that is intentional, right? That's what we started with. A gender lens strategy is, is one that, that really is rooted in intentionality. Um, so how do you avoid uh, greenwashing or sometimes uh, called pinkwashing in this in this sense uh, is really make it measurable. So that's the second part of this strategy. So um, collecting information, um, looking at uh, throughout your investment process, where can you set targets, perhaps monitor things and being realistic in that. Um, there are sources for sure. So we already very briefly mentioned the 2x collaborative. There's a lot of sources there, including, for example, what are criteria that you can look at? What are indicators that you can collect to really inform? Um, there is not really something like a certification around it yet. Uh, there are some certifications out there, um, but there is a lot already written on criteria, what it means to be really a gender lens investor. What is the role of men that men play in promoting gender equality? Oh, there's a very important role for men to play. Um, and I might invite Samuel as well to <laughs> um, light, shine some of your light on this. But from my, uh, from my side, uh, there have been a couple of movements, for example, the he for she movement. Um, and I think it is very important that men understand that, well, for one, gender inequality is not a women's problem. Huh? It's, it's a problem that we all have, 
Um, so it also means inequality in terms of what role you can play as a man and what roles you are uh, expected uh, as a man to play. So there is really, a, it, it's really affecting everybody. And then in terms of uh, what I mentioned, the, the, the he for she kind of movement, and I think that is important as well to really um, not only let this be solved by, by women, uh, but really stand together and make this voice that it is, it is something that affects us all, and it's something that benefits us all, investors, economically, everybody alike. And, and I think to add to this as well, and you mentioned it during the webinar, Coriane, this neutrality component doesn't really exist, right? So either we are contributing to the to the status quo, or we're actively contributing to to creating an environment that is that is equal and that is that is fair. Um, and that also means, as a man, to start talking about it and to addressing it and to approach it and to find solutions towards this. In the same way that uh, women are moving into this, in the end, we need to reach this point together. It's not a one man or a one woman show in that sense uh, to to achieve that goal. Can you give some concrete examples of investment opportunities in this field? Where can I invest now? Yeah, so I think it is, uh, there are many, many opportunities. So I don't think it is necessarily about uh, yeah, getting rid of your current investment strategy and now only doing uh, something new that is supposed to address uh, gender inequality. Um, I think the important part here is really understanding uh, where you have the impact, right? And where you can include women economically. Um, concrete examples, I think, uh, are really in terms of including women in a consumer base, for example. So if you look at financial inclusion, um, what are the barriers that women currently face in terms of getting financial services? Uh, is it, for example, sometimes difficult for them to travel physically to a branch and, and open a bank account? Um, or is it sometimes difficult for them uh, to have access to a mobile phone, to do it digitally? So really understanding, because this depends on the context and the region and where you operate. So really understanding what are the barriers, that I think is the most practical that you can do. I think also to add to that there, you as an investor, you are also kind of in the responsibility to ask questions, right? If you uh, addressing uh, this approach also means that you need to understand, for example, how an investment solution is set up and how the, the, the underlying companies or the investments are made and what kind of reporting is available so that you can make smart decisions based on that. So I think don't be afraid to ask the people that are advising you or making proposals to investments to confront them with these questions that you can you can really get the information that you that you need to make these decisions now i think we have time for another question how do you measure women's empowerment or positive impact for women well this is a good question um, I think it is generally quite difficult to really measure something like empowerment, right? Because it is a it is a, a social structure that's quite difficult to measure. So what gets measured very often is more on the uh, the output and outcome level. And there, I think it is very much in line with what Samuel is saying. There's a lot of information very often out there. So many companies will know actually what the composition of their uh, workforce looks like. What, uh, who are their customers, right? If they're a solid company, they will know who their customers are. So there you can actually track, right? Do you offer your uh, services um, to more women over time? Um, so I think that is very much the, the kind of level in which you want your information um, to come in. And um, there are some very interesting studies out there that really also look at the environment and, and then basically, for example, how financial uh, services um, ha actually impact the, the daily lives of women. Um, so that can also be very interesting to do some research on. So I think we're coming to the end of this webinar. We didn't get to answer all of your questions, but Samuel will reach out to you separately. Thank you very much, Corianne. Thank you, Samuel. And thank you all for joining us. For upcoming events, please follow us on LinkedIn. Happy International Women's Day. 
and goodbye. Happy International Women's Day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.